Good evening. I am Bill Hayner, Chair of the Arlington School Committee. This open meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of the public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely, so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature uh, public comment, but I've been informed we have no one signed up for it, so we won't have that tonight. This meeting, the Arlington School Committee is convening via Zoom is posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and that take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All of the materials for this meeting, except any executive session materials are available on the Novus Agenda dashboard or the town's website. And we recommend the members of the and the public follow the agenda as posted on Novus unless I, the chair, note otherwise. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda after they have concluded the remarks. The chair will ask if there any members have any questions or comments. Um, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in, and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. When I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Uh, yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes, here. Uh, Ms. Morgan. Yes. Dr. Bodie. Yes. Dr. McNeil. Yes. Mr. Spiegel. Yes. Mr. Mason. Yes. Ms. Elmer. Yes. AEA Representative Keys. Yes. And I think that's just about everybody that we're anticipating. Uh, we do not have anyone uh, for public comment, so I'm going to move to our first item uh, at this time, the school calendar. Dr. Bodie. Good evening. Um, this evening, um, I would like to have a first read of the uh, updated calendar. We've already had a read on earlier dates, start date uh, of school. Uh, what this represents tonight are two things to call your attention to. One, our kindergarten screens. Um, this year for FY21, we're going to be handling kindergarten screenings um, two different ways. One is on early release days uh, in June, we'll have some screenings, we'll have some on June 25th, which is the day after the last day of school, and we'll have um, teachers uh, um, doing screenings the week before we, we start school. So because of the nature of this year, we did not want to have um, our kindergarten students dismissing earlier than the other students. So we have rearranged how we're handling screenings. However, next year, um, we, will, we had had agreement with the union the teachers union to uh, have two days at the end of June be days where we could do the kindergarten screens, which are required by state law. And on those two days, uh, kindergarten, the last day for kindergarten students will be uh, Thursday, June um, 16th. 
because the screenings will occur on Friday the 17th and the following Monday. Obviously, it'd be nicer if it worked out so it wasn't across weekends, but that's the way the calendar fell next year. So that's one thing to um, call your attention to. And the other um, are the early release days for conferences for the middle school and for the high school next year. We did not put on evening conferences on the calendar. Uh, evening conferences will be announced by um, all of the, the secondary schools and remind and as well as the elementary schools um, in September. But it was important for parents to know when students would be dismissed, either for early release conferences or for an early release day. And those are all on this calendar. One thing I will say, and I will compliment Ms. Fitzgerald, I think it gets increasingly more difficult uh, to create uh, the codes for um, these, uh, these events, but uh, she's done a terrific job. And you can see in the, the um, gray area to the, to the right or to the left of the calendar what those um, particular days are. The other thing I would want to remind everybody is that um, the day after uh, Labor Day next year is going to be a no school day, as is for students the Wednesday to September 8th. That will be a professional development day for teachers. We have found this particular year that having some preparation days before school opens um, is very helpful. I'm not sure that that's how it will continue in the years after this, but for next year, we will have a, <clears throat> a professional development day. Kindergarten, everyone will start on the Thursday after Labor Day, which is the ninth. Um, what will be different for kindergarten is that kinder, half the class of kindergarten will, will come to school on Thursday, the other half on Friday, and on Monday, uh, all, all students will attend. What will, uh, I can't tell you parents right now, um, you know, which day your, your child will be attending, but you will know, um, if not this month, uh, soon into July, what day that will be. It certainly will be before school starts. So that, that's, those are the highlights, uh, Mr. Hainer, of the calendar. I don't know if there's any questions um, everyone has. This is, the, I wanna remind you, this is a first read. So if there's some, some things we need to alter or you have some questions about, this would be a good time to, to mention them. Thank you, Dr. Bodie. Ms. Morgan. Um, Dr. Bodie, why does the middle school early release day not line up with the elementary early release day? Um, because, well, we're considering that, but uh, the middle school, well, the curriculum leaders and administrators would prefer. Dr. Bodie's screen, I think, froze. We lost your audio, Dr. Bodie. Uh, can you hear me, Mr. Hayes? Yes, we can now. Oh, I don't know. I, I, it seems like Ms. Morgan froze. Maybe that's me. Um, OK. Um, we changed it so there'd be more flexibility around meeting times. Can you hear me? Oh, it does say my connection is unstable. Is that better? Um, the reason is we wanted more flexibility for a meeting schedule for the uh, six, for the Gibbs, Honest, and the high school. Uh, having all the meetings on the same day rather than different days would provide that flexibility. Hmm. Okay, my feedback is for families, it's always easier if kids at different levels, there's lots of people who have kids who are in middle school and kids who are in elementary school or, you know, so I think it's, I, I, I appreciate the rationale for it, but um, I, I think it's, it's hard for teachers with kids 
in this district who teach at one level and have kids being released on different days at different times. So, um, but I, you know, I guess we give it a try and see maybe other parents don't care and we'll, you know, or we'll, we'll get a lot of feedback about it. And <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it, it's just the same old, same old, right? It's, it's that you've got kids coming and going and they're not on this. And I appreciate they're not on the same schedule right now anyway, with the 2.30 and the three o'clock release. It's just, um, I, it's just more I do, of that. Yeah, I do appreciate that. And that was something that was considered as well. Um, what has historically been the case is that the middle school has been on the same day as elementary and the high school different. So we've always had a split that way um, in, in our meeting and early release days. Um, if this is something that is something you would like us to take back and have some reconsideration of, uh, we can certainly take a look at that. But this was what we thought would work the best next year. Any other members have any questions regarding the calendar at this time on the first read? Seeing none, I just like to, and it's easy for me to say because I don't have any children at all. Um, if the rationale is to have the, the sixth through 12th grade faculty working together. I think we ought to try it. Um, it if it does if if it is a massive inconvenience for parents and stuff, the parents need to let us know so we can make adjustments to that. So, so do we need a motion for the first read? You know, no. Point of order no, there, okay. Bill. You have two children. Bill, Bill, you have two children. You said you yes, but they, they're teach they're both teachers in other districts. Okay, Thank you, right. Jeff, for reminding me. So my wife doesn't get upset with me. I was worried about that. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> uh, I've always been worried. Never mind. Uh, so we're going to move on um, to uh, the district goals uh, 2020, 2020, 2021. And I, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. McNeil at this time. So I submitted the document. I do want to uh, provide some clarification because one of the school committee members uh, emailed me. Uh, the document that you have in front of you was I was asked to provide a document that gives the status of each one of the goals. And I did that in anticipation. Well, I did. I was asked to do that to give out to you um, very early on so that if you had any questions regarding any of the goals, you could send them to me through email. So that is why the document does not include other information. But I will state that, you know, in my department of curriculum and instruction, the curriculum leaders are preparing a more um, detailed document that will provide evidence and more information regarding the goals and their status. Thank you. So Does anybody the, have any questions or comments for Dr. McNeil on the 2020-2021 goals? Seeing none. I am going to, and if I move too quick, folks, don't hesitate. I know you won't. Uh, to the district goals for 2021, 2022. And uh, I'm not sure if it's Dr. McNeil or Dr. Bordy that's going to start this off. I had both names down on my agenda. Um, well, both of us, both of us can talk to these goals. Um, one of the, one of the other reasons why wanted to give an update on uh, at least a very high level, uh, very high level look at what happened with the 2021 is that there are a number of um, uh, broad objectives we want to continue next year, which you, which you will see in the district goals for 21-22. Before I begin that though, let me just say that one of the things that we have an agreement with, and Ms. Keyes is here and you can talk to it if you'd like, is that we would have uh, the district goals um, approved for next year by the school committee by the end of the school year. And the purpose for that um, is so that teachers, if they're planning any of their own professional development over the summer or be, want to begin working on their goals, they know what the uh, parameters are, what we're looking to focus on next year. And so this is, there's still quite a bit of work left to be done on this in, in terms of 
uh, really taking these down to the next level in terms of the action plans that's going to uh, be uh, provided for each one of these. As you can see with the 2021 goal, what, what, what is um, evident in these is how broadly they are assumed uh, within departments in terms of uh, a department having a very specific goal related to the district objective. And that's exactly what will happen with the 21-22 goals is that we will have a, a much more detailed look at what are going to be the actions uh, that we're going to do in support of these. A number of years, again, I want to go back to sort of a high level look at this. Um, a number of years ago, the school committee um, developed overarching goals for the district, sort of the, sort of the strategic plan um, of the district in terms of direction. And every year, uh, we develop objective goals uh, that focus those uh, particular um, overarching goals. And a third layer are those particular objective goals, how they, how they manifest in each department. So um, there are, there's another layer to this. If you, if you, the wording is a little different, but not substantially different in terms of the objective goals under student achievement. Um, we are, are still going to be looking at inclusive pedagogy and curricula that is, um, that is aligned with our district vision of student as learner and global citizen. We're being very, much more specific about that this year. And with an emphasis, emphasis on the transferable skills. And of course, all of our curriculum is aligned to the state standards. So that, that is the first objective. And it really hasn't shifted very much from last year. And then another major focus for next year, and we've all talked about this throughout, throughout the year, is the need that we have in our district to make sure that um, we have, we support our students in developing social emotional skills uh, with age appropriate social emotional curriculum. And that work has been going on this year and will continue next year. And, and as we've talked about how important it's going to be to make sure that, that um, those kinds of supports are there for students next year. So th that's sort of the broad focus of goal number one under student achievement. Um, Dr. Dr. Mizio, you wanna talk a little bit about the professional um, uh, Staff Excellence and Professional Development. I was muted, sorry. Oh, okay. So um, looking at the uh, professional development goals, I mean, basically we're continue continuing our focus on uh, providing professional development around uh, culturally responsive instruction uh, and uh, SEL and learning and continuing to integrate uh, and so that teachers are able to integrate it into their instruction. And so we will continue that theme for next year. And then that is a goal objective 2.1. And I can, are there any questions about that? Yes. Ms. Morgan. Uh, uh, Mr. Hainer. I'm sorry, Mr. I'm sorry, Mr. Hainer. <laughs> I should Mr. wait. Hainer. That's all right. I'm hearing that there's no sound on ACMI. So Sean, that's the story. Oh. Okay. But I, but I will, uh, uh, you know, definitely um, acknowledge uh, Dr. Bodie's uh, emphasis that these are high level. And so I just wanna make sure that, you know, we, uh, within the, the, the Department of Curriculum and Instruction and within the, you know, with the district, we will continue to develop action steps for how we're gonna continue that. And we'll base those action steps upon our, um, what we were able to accomplish this year, and then you can look at the goal document that shows the status 
of the goals where they have the where it has those action steps and we will provide evidence and then we would um, use that evidence and the data that we collected this year from many different um, uh, sources in order to continue to create goals moving forward. Let me just interject for one second. In the fact that we do not have anyone coming from the public uh, to uh, participate at this time, uh, other than the panelists that are currently here, the recording will be made available to the public. So I'm not too worried about it uh, going out over ACMI live at this time. Um, sorry, Dr. McNeil, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just no, want to I, make that, that clear to everyone. Yes, sir. I, I just finished. And uh, thank I, you. There's somebody has their hand raised. Uh, Ms. Exton. And Dr. Allison Anthony also has her hand just. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thank you, Dr. McNeil um, and Dr. Bodhi. And I, I guess my sort of questions and comments relate to both goal one and two. I noticed um, that the phrase awareness of cultural bias was removed from goal objective 1.2. Um, so one of my questions is just, can you talk about your thinking about why that um, was? And my thinking of, in asking that is, um, you know, we did a lot of work around the equity audit, um, where we have this panorama survey, uh, we have a new position, um, the director of DEI, and I, and I see them included in objective 2.2, um, but, you know, when we think of our, of our district, um, you know, becoming culturally responsive and thinking about anti-racist and anti-bias teaching, um, I, I hear you that it's going to be in the more specific layers of different departments, um, but I guess my my thoughts and my comments before I think it's important to also have it somewhere in these high level goals. Thank you. Um, you know, you're absolutely right. Um, so a lot of the work that's going to happen this year, we should really be more specific. Let me add that in. I think you have a good point, Ms. Sexton. Um, well, there is going to be quite a bit of departmental work on incorporating some of the um, the suggestions that came through in the, in the curriculum audit, and there's work that's going on this summer. And uh, let let me go back, and we'll we'll send out I, I update that a little bit, and send it back out for when we do the second read and the vote next next meeting. And, and I will add on, Ms. Exton, as we develop our very specific content area goals, that will definitely be included in those um, in that language. And, and the use of the equity audit, uh, our equity, um, the SEL audit that was also done in our SEL curriculum, the equity, we, Dr. Simmons also reviewed those materials. So we will definitely make, you know, make sure that that language is in there because that is the work that will be uh, completed this summer and continue on uh, throughout next year. Thank you. And I, I know that it will be in those, you know, deeper layers, but I just, if somebody's in the community or is just looking at that, the big picture here on this two page document, and that's what they're taking from it. I think it's important to have yeah. it there. So sure thank you. That, that's a great point. Yeah. Thank you for pointing yeah. out. Yeah, I think that in our rewording of some of it, we, we, it was an oversight in our part. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, actually, sure. the objective 2.2, uh, which has to do actually related to this, is the work that we've been doing around um, uh, finding ways to make our, our teaching staff, our paraprofessional staff much more diverse so that we, we have more of our staff that, that represents the, the, um, the range of cultural, ethnic, and racial backgrounds of our students. That work will continue. And we're always looking for ways that we can, we can do that. So that particular objective, um, again, to call attention to this work, which is ongoing, remains in the district goals. Slightly reworded, but the same idea. And, and Mr. Hainer, I want to point out that Dr. Allison Ampey yes, had her I, I hand up. Just for wait, wait for Dr. Bodhi to finish. Dr. Ampey. Thank you. 
Um, and thank you, Dr. Bodhi and Dr. McNeil. I have a question about, I guess it's really kind of about both goal one and maybe goal two. I just wondered that the word pandemic isn't mentioned anywhere and that this year or the coming year is different again than just about every other educational year because we were coming out of the pandemic and things have been different for a long time and whether that implies we should be doing things a little differently next year to kind of make up for that. And I'm, I, I don't have specific suggestions right at this moment, but I wanted to raise that as a point. And if I was a parent looking at district goals, having spent much of the past year with my kids at home or, or um, doing hybrid and, and everything, I would feel like this is something which should be touched upon. So um, okay. that's, that's my comment. Well, it's, yes, great comment. And let me, let me take a look at that. Um, I can tell you that certainly on our mind because it, we're, as all the work that we're doing this summer, the, the idea is now, is, are we not only gonna look at from the point of view of the curriculum audit, but you know what is it that we are going to need to do next year um, to address some of these issues? Uh, because we know that we'll have students th that will need some form of refreshing uh, um, and perhaps more time on particular topics uh, in review than we normally would have. So it's certainly on the minds of all of the administrators as we're developing the curriculum work for the summer. I will say that uh, this particular year, in light of just what you're talking about, we are going to have more curriculum work going on this summer than we have had in the past years. And so it's because of that, this focus, as well as because of the focus of the curriculum audit as we go into um, next year. So what you're asking for is some acknowledgement of how um, the pandemic year is, is influencing the curriculum work that we're doing next, for next year. Yeah, okay. that just that I think there, I mean, what you said you're doing sounds great. And I think what's written should reflect that. Okay. Right, so that people right. understand you know, when they read this, they have some understanding that this is what's going on behind the scenes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it, and if you, in the terms of dollar amounts, um, I think you'll you'll understand why I say that we're probably spending three times as much this summer as we had two summers ago on curriculum professional professional work. So, um, all right. Any uh, other questions, comments yes. on these first two um, goals? Ms. Ms. Morgan has her hand up. You're muted, Jane. My question's on the last goal, so I, I will wait. Okay. All right. So going on to goal three, which really the uh, for people that will eventually get this recording, uh, looks at all of the resources and infrastructure and the learning environments in our school. And one of the, one of the areas of focus that, that we've already begun to look at, but also will continue, has to continue this summer and next year, is developing the, the, the technology plan for the next three years. We've had one, um, see any of the past technology plans, but an update to that is going to be um, part of the work that's already ongoing, but it's certainly going to be much more significant this summer. Any questions or any comments on those? That one. Okay, we can move on. 
All right, we're starting to move into, um, in goal three, uh, again, part of the infrastructure. And I will ask Ms. Um, Elmer if she would talk a little bit about this, which is the tiered uh, focus um, monitoring that we will be doing uh, this coming year and what, what this comes from in terms of um, the work report that we received this year. Ms. Elmer, do you mind, Mr. Hainer, if I defer this? Go right ahead. Okay. All right. Sure. So just quickly, um, and I believe Dr. McNeil is going to um, share that report with you in an upcoming meeting, but um, what was formerly known as the Coordinated Program Review is now Tiered Focus Monitoring. As you recall, in January, um, we had our on-site visit, which was postponed from last year um, when they were initially going to be on and then um, on-site in the pandemic hit. Um, and so we received that report. It was issued on May 20th. Um, and they review both civil rights and um, special ed criteria. This is what was known as the mid cycle previously, now it's known as cycle B. So it was a smaller um, review. And so those findings were issued and the district has to develop a continuous improvement and monitoring plan, continuous improvement and monitoring plan, um, which Dr. McNeil, um, as I said, will eventually share with you folks, but this goal is around implementing that action plan. And I will add on that the report is has been uh, put on our district website and it's on the news feed. So it's there for the public uh, to have access to which the public can have access. Can you, can you just give a brief over, overview, both of you, in terms of what, are, what would be so sort of the main focus of the, of the work on this? Sure. So um, there were not any findings specifically in special education for this cycle. Um, and there were two findings in the civil rights um, uh, criteria. And is that echo for me? I'm sorry. Um, so from this civil rights criterion. And so those two action items um, revolve around um, uh, policies and procedures. As you recall, we discussed at a previous school committee uh, meeting the need to revise the restraint policy so that the policy you adopted matches the current regulations. So that's reflected as part of the action items and as um, and making sure that those regulations are publicly available. And um, the other one was around um, documentation and our notices for discipline. And so those have been updated and also shared within the, um, uh, will be updated and shared within the handbooks. Do any members have any questions or comments? Okay, moving on. Um, so then the then uh, goal um, four, which overarching goal talks about operations, communications, and stakeholder engagement. So as we have in for many years now, we have a goal around the high school, the new high school. And uh, each year there is new, new ways that we um, were working on this project. Everyone can see that the high school is going up quite, you know, more noticeably every day. What we're going to see is continuously um, more refined space, so much so that the plan is that next year we will be moving into the new STEAM wing and the performing arts wing of the new high school. In fact, this is one thing I did not mention on the calendar, which relates to this, um, is that the high school um, will need a half day right before February vacation and a half day in the morning when we return from February vacation for um, moving. Um, I'm sure there'll be a lot of packing before that, but the actual moving of materials will start that Friday right before February vacation. So, so there's, there's going to be a lot. In fact, tomorrow is another transition planning meeting. And I think that these meetings actually are going to um, increase as we go forward. So that goal will continue. Um, then, uh, the, uh, I, maybe Mr. Mason will talk a little bit about some of these. Uh, one of them uh, is uh, our collaboration with the facilities department in terms of uh, making sure that we continue to have health 
and, and safe learning environments in our school. They, as you know, they did yeoman's job last summer to make sure that all of our ventilation systems were at the design capacity. But what we know is that these are, in some cases, older systems and the, um, the amount of you know, constant vigilance to make sure that these are um, up to um, the level they should be will continue. Um, there are also going to be other infrastructures that are, will be looked at and put in place as we go forward next year and want to acknowledge that work. And I don't know if Mr. Mason would like to, to add anything to that because he works very closely with the director of facilities. Yeah, I can add some more information in terms of uh, the goals under um, 4.2 and uh, 4.3. Um, so more specifically, um, the town recently released the net zero action plan. And so uh, myself, as well as Greg Walters, the new facilities director and Ken Pruitt, the energy manager for the town, we've been uh, working um, on a plan to complete electric, electrification um, in many of the schools to meet what the net zero action plan calls for which wants all town buildings to be electrified by um, completely, a complete electrification by 2050. Um, so um, one of the, part of the plan is, uh, is the creation of an electric, electrification and air quality master plan, um, which uh, this plan will be part of a evaluation of several of the school buildings, which include the Audison, the Brackett, Dallin, Bishop Hardy, and the Pierce. Um, and so actually we'll be starting to do those studies uh, right in the summertime. And this will hopefully identify any issues um, or any enhancement projects that we may need to do and hopefully outline the scheduling of projects over the next uh, several years. Um, uh, in goal 4.3 touches upon that, those things, but 4.2 kind of overlaps with some of those works because of the air quality master plan. Um, and so also with the with 4.3, we're talking about what, what's also called out in the net zero action plan, which is tied to electrification of the, the vehicle fleet. And uh, we, we've we been doing some work trying to also uh, begin to change out some of our diesel vehicles to uh, electric vehicles. So we're in the process of um, looking to get up to two uh, electric buses, uh, depending on funding. Um, we've been awarded already some funding for that um, to get at least one bus and to build the infrastructure as well as the, uh, how can I say, uh, the, the actual procurement of the bus. Um, and uh, if we get some additional funds along with the capital funding, we would then get another bus as well and uh, turn over those two vehicles. But the, the key thing is now, as we get more these other vehicles, we, we need to start thinking long-term about where we would place the, the vehicle. So that will be something that we'll be talking about in the future because there's no central place for the, our, our student vehicles. Um, and then 4.4 is just a continuation of what we set up, we uh, established last year, and as we're continuing to implement uh, uh, more policies and procedures. Um, and in, in trying to modernize the financial procedures. And one of the ways we're looking at is, you know, increasing how to decrease the, re the reliance on paper and, and move to more electronic workflows. Uh, which will then also help some of the processes when we are moving over to our new offices uh, uh, in a few years with the Arlington High School project. Any questions or comments from the members? Mr. Thielman and then Mr. Schlickman. And I'll get the uh, rest of you. Okay, so uh, thanks very much. I, th I think... Um, so the one thing I want to say is that it, it feels to me that in the next year or so or two, um, we should we should start to begin a conversation about um, 
submitting an SOI to the MSBA in the not too distant future uh, for the Odyssey Middle School. Um, and <clears throat> I don't exactly know when to begin it, but I, I, I do know that we have a very good relationship with the MSBA because we've had successful projects, the Thompson the High School and lots of other ones. And so it is possible for uh, us to have as a goal objective to initiate a dialogue with the MSBA to understand um, an appropriate timetable to begin an SOI, uh, to submit an SOI to the Commonwealth for the Addison Middle School. And, you know, I mean, just to kind of, I don't, I don't know when you get excited too excited about it. We have a $289 million project taking place right now on Mass Ave. <clears throat> $86 million is coming from the Commonwealth to the town of Arlington. We're not going to be high on their list. Um, but um, uh, this, you know, as we know, it's the process of the high school rebuild started in 2015 uh, and won't finish until 2025. And so it's a long-term process. And I don't know how to quite put this in the goal. I haven't articulated. I just started thinking about this this afternoon when I read this. But um, I just wanted to put that out there that you know a goal next year could be to uh, <clears throat> begin a dialogue with the MSBA to learn about uh, the appropriate process and time timeline um, for an evaluation of the Addison Middle School facility. That's simple because we all know there's when you begin this process with the MSBA, if you're accepted into it, you might not come out with a brand new school. You might come out with a repair or a renovation addition or a new school. Um, so I wanted to throw that out there uh, tonight. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Schlickman. I really appreciate Mr. Thielman's thoughtful comments because if we're going for electrification of our buildings, uh, the Odyssey seems to be, in my mind, the most challenging one to, to uh, bring up to new standards as uh, we renovated that in the late 90s and the um, equipment in that building is late 90s equipment. <clears throat> my question revolves the vehicles. I'm sort of interested in this. First of all, I've noticed that we're parking our buses up by the uh, the church up in the uh, in the heights. Uh, I, I guess that's a, a move that was dictated by the, uh, uh, the the high school renovation project and the town yard, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, are we in a position now where we can purchase electric vehicles to replace all our current non-electric vehicles, such as the buses? Is the technology are, are the buses available to purchase at this point in time? Well, the buses, the technology is there, but currently the, it's, it's quite expensive. So the cost of an electric bus mm -hmm. is three times the cost of a diesel bus mm -hmm. currently. Uh, we anticipate those costs to go down over time. Um, as you see, like the electric vehicles are all are all becoming mainstream by mainstream manufacturers. Uh, I'd imagine the same thing's gonna happen to buses as well as the technology that is used in buses. Um, maybe range is a, is a current concern. So the vehicles that we would, uh, that we're currently looking to procure, they may not be, be able to be used in the same manner um, as our diesel vehicles. But I imagine as we, as time goes on, we would be able to get more similar functionality out of the vehicles. Um, that's, that's interesting. I would imagine that uh, given the new federal administration's uh, uh, push towards electrification of vehicles, that incentives may be down the line to correspond to improvements in, in, in the vehicles so that it would make sense that if we have a vehicle replacement project on the horizon, we might want to push it out a year or two for the purpose of being in a better market for doing electric. Uh, are, are we sort of doing that within the con context of the capital plan? So, you know, we in our capital plan, we uh, have a, a vehicle schedule that where we replace vehicles on a, you know, on a, on a timely basis, a periodic basis. So for yeah. our, our school buses, we look between five to seven years because after five to six years, the maintenance starts to creep up mm -hmm. and 
the vehicle values decrease. So we, we start to trade them in to get a different diesel vehicle. Um, what's being said about electric, the electric bus is that they do have a guaranteed lifespan and warranty for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. So we're at least we'll get 10 years use out of the vehicles that we would procure in this uh, string of procurement. Um, in terms of how we get more electric vehicles in the future, it all depends on the capital funding and then as well as any grants that are available. So we're able to do this purchase mainly due to the grants that we are receiving. Um, we're receiving a substantial amount. Uh, the town of Arlington would probably be funding about $183,000 through the capital plan. Mm -hmm. And then the remainder is coming from grants. Mm -hmm. um, the initial study dollars have been coming from, um, fortunately from some of our funds this year from the facilities department. Um, but yeah, so that's, I mean, I hope that answers your question in terms of the scheduling and placement of the vehicle in the future. What are we thinking we may need in terms of land-based infrastructure for charging buses and charging and maintaining electrical vehicles? Well, well, in general, I would say that we need uh, to build an infrastructure out, but as well have physical location for all the vehicles in the central location that is on town property. Uh, so it, it's right, right now we're paying a private property for space. And mm -hmm. when we were trying to determine where we would put buses, it was, you know, we were had to discuss whether we wanted to put public dollar investment to a private property where we currently hold buses. So, you know, one of the, the ideas that we've been trying to talk about is maybe some kind of parking structure. Um, but, you know, we haven't really dived too deep in it. We need to find a location for, for such a place uh, to store our vehicles. I'm sure the town has similar needs. Okay, uh, I, I'm just sort of thinking this out and, and hoping that people who are knowledgeable about this and really interested in electric vehicles and, and, and infrastructure are also Can paying I, attention to this part of the meeting. Yeah. Kathy may have something to say. Um, yes, um, I, I think that one of the things that they're going to, you're going to spend more time talking about next year is exactly this issue. We're hoping we will have these electric buses and we already have a a plan, uh, a tentative plan for how we would create charging stations for these two. But this mm -hmm. is a not a long, this isn't long term for all the buses we potentially could have. Um, as you know, public space is at, at public properties that is very limited. And so there are, uh, Mr. Mason mentioned infrastructure. Um, perhaps a garage of some sort. And we have some ideas around those. I think they're a little premature to uh, float them right now, but I do think that this is something that the town, the, the school department can have to look at. Even if we don't have electric buses mm -hmm. um, or we have some mixed fleet for a number of time, for a number of years, we are going to need to look at where they're going to be housed. And right now, as you know, we're, we're in the middle of the mm -hmm. high school construction project. And, and, and previously, so everybody knows this, they were, they were parked at the DPW. DPW is, is also under construction, will be soon. And I can tell you that in the final plan, in the plans for DPW, there is no allocation of space for our buses. So this is no small issue, actually, mm -hmm. that we are going to need to figure out in the years to come. I'd like us to get back. I, I know that broadly this is on the goals, but I'd like to get back. Ms. Morgan, mm -hmm. before, question before on the goals. That, let, let, let me just state, I, I hope that we were able to push forward as quickly as possible. And, you know, Mr. Hainer has a pretty big driveway, so we can put a charge in state. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Hainer. <laughs> You're welcome. Ms. Morgan. Thank you. So I had a question about goal 4.2 about the safe and healthy learning environment, which obviously I think is super duper duper important <laughs> um, and would like to continue very much and was um, a little bit uh, surprised at how far we had to go last summer when we needed to like up that safe and healthy learning environment, but also appreciate that it was 
an extraordinary amount of work from the facilities department. Absolutely think that this is something that we should continue to do. I am a little concerned about the precedent of, of having it be, be a, a goal on the level of all these other goals that we have, because in my mind, this is just something that we should be doing. Um, so, I, you know, I appreciate that goals can be aspirational or they can be about holding, you know, about keeping accountability. And I guess maybe this is more the latter. Um, so I guess that's, that's my feedback on 4.2. I think it's really important that we maintain heating, ventilation and air exchange infrastructure and that we ensure it works at, you know, the capacity that it's designed for. Um, I, I guess I just feel like this is something we should be doing and um, that that's the expectation. But if, if in order to sort of canonize it, into what we need to do if it needs to be in the goals. I guess I just worry that if we have it in the goals for FY22 and then it's not somehow there for FY23, then is it like, oh, so we're now not doing that anymore, if that makes sense. So that's my concern about having it there. It feels sort of precedent setting. And then if we somehow remove it, does that mean that then we won't be maintaining these systems? So I, I guess part of my question is about intent and then my feedback mm -hmm from reading it, regardless of what the intent is, is that this seems like an accountability goal as opposed to an aspirational goal. So uh, if I can uh, respond, uh, thank Go you ahead. for, thank you. Uh, thank you for your comment, Jane, in regards to or the feedback in, in terms of what that goal is stating. And uh, my, my logic, and when I was talking to Kathy about uh, the efforts is a, I mean, as we are moving from what we just dealt with from the last year or so, um, it's still important. I think it's still uh, important to keep that on this list for that reason um, um, until we know for sure uh, that we're not going to stop doing those things, but it's the level of what we're doing is come somewhat different. And so what I would say into this, in this, in, in, into that regard is that we were also concerned about like how to make spaces more comfortable, right? So without saying comfortable in the goal, um, because to make a, a, a great environment that's good for students, you know, some of that deals with the ventilation, making sure that you get the right level of air exchanges, the right level of cooling. And so I kind of 4.2 and 4.3, there are some similarities because of the electrification of the buildings, but some of the work that's being done is uh, tied to how do we can get the air systems to be more modern and efficient. And uh, some of the decisions that were made when buildings were built, whether they have cooling systems or not, how to get those buildings uh, into a, a way that teachers and students are comfortable. And that's what the intent of that particular goal is and I think it's important to keep it there. Right. That seems um, more that seems more aspirational to me. So I like yeah. I like that. Yeah. I will add on to it without creating perhaps false expectations what well, expectations we might not be able to achieve is we do want to look at buildings being more comfortable. Some of the buildings can get so hot. And it's hard to say in the future really uh, what's going to happen with our climate, we've had, knock on wood, we only had a few really hot days so far, and we're hoping to get through the rest of the year without these, but that's what we say every year. You know, at least some of the buildings get so hot and we've, you know, we buy fans or, you know, we, we just had a chiller that is, was put into Dallin, but that's not all of our schools. We, we need to really look at this issue um, and not be trying to patch it all the time, um, it's hard to be in a building where it's excessive on either side, too cold, too hot. And we really do need to, to see what we can do about that. Any other comments on the goals? This is the first, huh? Mr. Schlickman. Uh, my, other, my only other question is, has this, uh, been shared with uh, Dr. Homan, and uh, I guess that's the question. 
Um, the answer is no, but we're meeting on Friday and that's actually tomorrow. Um, and Dr. Holman is listening this evening, but yeah, we will go over these goals for sure. Yeah, I just want to make sure because she's the one who's going to own these things. <laughs> well, they we I will say as a district, we, we all own them. Um, and everyone that's here this evening owns owns it as well as the school committee. Uh, to, you know, so the, your role is accountability on the work that work that we're doing. But yes, you're absolutely correct. Um, and we'll, we'll be talking about these tomorrow. We all set to move on. Thank you, Dr. Bodie. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. Um, moving on to appointment to EDCO Board of Directors and the EDCO Advisory Board. Dr. Bodie, do you want to talk to this or do you want me to do it? Um, I can start, I'll do a little overview and then how about if you jump in? Um, as, <laughs> unless you want to start it. Go right ahead. Um, as we look at next year, everyone is aware of that from the discussions we've had that unfortunately EDCO as an organization is going to dissolve in June 22. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some of our, some other issues around this, uh, but it, but under collaborative law for the, uh, for the Department of Education, there still needs to be governance next year as we go through the last year. Uh, and under the new collaborative regulations, there has to be six um, board meetings. And that is the plan. We have elected a new um, chair of the, of the board, Bella Wong, uh, the current superintendent, Lincoln Sudbury. And the uh, vice chair is um, Peter Light, superintendent, Acton Boxborough. On the board of directors, there are three out of 16 members, there are three that are school committee um, uh, members. So there, it's sort of a, it's, well, it's not 50-50, it's sort of a mix. There are two, there's both also an advisory board uh, that meets and, and attends board meetings. So I have been the representative to the board for a number of years. And obviously I'm not going to be here next year. So the school committee is going to need to appoint uh, someone as both the, the um, board representative with that, that responsibility. The board meetings are during the, the day. They tend to be in the morning. Uh, so we did have one this year that was in the evening. So school committee members could attend. And uh, then an advisory board member. Uh, and sort of as a, somebody to talk about what's going on as well as, as an alternative. But I think next year Arlington should uh, should have representation at every board meeting. So that's a little bit of the, the background on what we need to do. Um, I talked with Dr. Bodie about this. Um, she uh, shared with me that she felt that this is mainly a man, uh, position this year of being represented uh, finding out, coming back to the board, our board and sharing and uh, bringing back any decision that we, issues that are, will be brought through the board, uh, through me as the member, back to you, decisions made, and I, I'd be the conduit going back and forth. Um, I shared this with Dr. Holman and basically said to her, if you want it, you can have it. And she said, this is what she would prefer, if, since it's just a one year time, that it would be better off her focusing her time in other areas. So she, uh, so, and the fact that it is during the day, um, I have the I have the time. Uh, Mr. Schlickman has the time. So I'm recommending to the board, our board, our committee here, uh, the appointment of myself as the uh, our Arlington member uh, person on the board of directors and Mr. Schlickman for the advisory board. I'm gonna need a motion to that effect. So move, so move. Is there a second? Second. Is there any further discussion at this time? Seeing none, I will do a roll call vote. Um, Ms. Exton. Yes. Ms. Morgan. 
Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Uh, Dr. Rampey. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. And myself, yes, unanimous vote. Thank you all. Uh, down Massachusetts Association of School Committee Delegate Assembly Resolutions, Mr. Schlickman. Having heard from nobody, uh, I don't see a pressing need for us to sponsor a resolution. We'll be back uh, the early fall with the resolutions that were presented to the uh, to the uh, resolutions committee, which I have traditionally served on for uh, our opinions and direction for the general assembly in in November. Thank you, Mr. Schlickman. Um, monthly financial report, Mr. Mason. All right, thank you, uh, Ms. Tainer. Um, tonight, uh, I would like to discuss uh, the monthly financial, financial reports for April 30th, for the period ending April 30th. Uh, the report uh, format is the same as always. I'm not gonna go into that, but um, what I will say is that you may notice some slight changes in terms of um, what's presented on the general fund report. A, you'll see that salary encumbrances are, are not reflected, it's reflected on the projected encumbrances. Uh, due to the end of year spending, um, there was a limitations to our financial system. So we switched to a manual uh, mechanism to control the salaries in the budget. Um, and that will be returned uh, back to normal encumbering starting the new fiscal year. Uh, as well as this, this month, we changed the methodology on how we project the general fund. Normally, we project the general fund uh, spending all our, our, all the department and school budgets are projected to spend to, to fully spend their budgets. And in the month of April, as we normally do every year, um, we kind of slow down some of the departmental spending um, and as, as it's difficult to sometimes get orders in by or orders received before the end of the year, um, as well as give us an idea of what is remaining in our budget and some other, you know, set aside some funds for other particular projects that we may need to do um, between facilities and IT in the information technology. Uh, so you'll see that we're currently projecting uh, in this, uh, Monthly report, $452,000. Um, this is based on, once again, all the current encumbrances and uh, known salaries that are expected to hit. This doesn't mean that this is the final number at this point. Uh, I did include everything that I could include uh, from after April 30th that I knew when drafting this report. Um, but, but I would say that there's about $5 million still there encumbered. And a lot of those encumbrances are estimates. Um, and sometimes that does not mean that the department will hit the amount that they originally encumbered. And so the, the amount returned could be more than this or it can be uh, uh, less. So uh, I would say this is a good estimate, but I would hold off until when we give you a final number and we'll keep everybody posted about that. And then also included is just the grants for accounts report which is everything is, is running as anticipated. There's no changes in any of the grants that we, we normally have on track and the revolving fund report, um, which you'll see that as, hasn't really changed much since the last time I spoke and presented, but um, you know, you'll look at overall for the year, the revenue is down. Um, and just to, you know, for those, for some to understand is that some of the, the new, uh, ARPA funding that may be coming to the town will provide some support for the lost revenue. Um, so I will end my presentation there and open up for any questions through the chair. Any member, any of the members have any questions or comments? For Mr. Mason. Mr. Carden. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Mason. Could you just go over that last point a little bit in more detail? So ARPA funds that's gonna all happen before the end of the fiscal year or, or what's, what's, what are you talking about there? No. ARPA funds is, is uh, so the town of Arlington 
has an allocation of over 30, about $36 million, I believe. And a part of those funds can be used for lost revenue that uh, has incurred due to the pandemic. And where we do a calculation using the base, uh, the base year, which was before the pandemic, which was fiscal 19, that was the full complete year that um, they would look at revenue and then use that to compare the fiscal years after that. So if you look at the grants, I mean, the revolving report, you'll see that total revenue is around two point, we, we were, were around $2 million currently and the current expenditures is around $3 million. Fortunately, we're able to do this because we've had balances in some of our funds. But um, ARPA, the ARPA funding are the, the mechanism, there is a stipulation in there where districts or towns can claim on select, select types of uh, revenue. If the revenue is lower uh, than the base revenue, we can then claim that and that would come back to the town. Right, so just to be a little bit more concrete. So for example, the foreign exchange revenue that you know we're expecting 250, we always get 250, Correct. we got zero. So it's possible that we could submit a claim to uh, under ARPA for that 250,000. Would that then go into that account or, or would that just go to the general town budget? Do we know that yet? Do not know that information yet. So it might, it, so it's helpful to the town, but we just don't know yet if that's actually going to help us directly. Okay, Correct. thank you. Mr. Slickman. Thank you. I would imagine that a lot of the decisions regarding the ARPA funding will be made uh, in relation to next year's budget and possible additions to uh, that we would have going forward next year. Is that correct? So in, in terms of the, the revenue loss that I was just speaking of? Or any additional funding coming in, both the revenue loss line item and anything else that might be coming our way. Yeah, the ARPA funding is it will go in until fiscal 24. So it's okay. not just next year. Okay, so we're we've got three years of which to use this pot of money going forward to compensate for issues that uh, evolved during the pandemic. Correct. That answers my question. And, 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 and one of them was revolving around heating and ventilation as well. So that's also another reason why we were talking about early the goals and stuff. I yeah, so we can, so we can do some uh, HVAC work going forward with this ARPA money that we normally wouldn't do. So it's an addition in, in, on the capital side. Correct. Okay, and the last final question, which I think is an easy one to answer, we don't see a line item for antacid and stomach me uh, medicine, so I assume you're happy and optimistic going forward through the end of the fiscal year. Yes, I am Excellent. happy and fine with that. As, as long as we don't see that line item on the budget, I think that, that we could relax a little. Thank you very much, <laughs> great job. Any other questions from the board to the finance? Seeing me. None. Oh, hey, sorry, I apologize. I'm sorry, Dr. Ampey. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I'll go for the ARPA question first. Uh, Mr. Mason, I understand what you're saying about the lost revenue, but couldn't ARPA funds also be used for um, certain aspects of education, um, making it for, for learning loss or anything? So a part of the American Rescue Plan is that um, there's the ESSER three funds, which is called the ARP ESSER, um, which is, was, a re was recently um, uh, allocated, the allocations were recently announced and um, the town of Arlington will get about $1.1 million. Okay, so those are separate from ARPA. That, but, yeah, that is set. Sorry, okay. that is separate from the, the, the municipal side of ARPA, correct? Okay. Okay. That answers no. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. 
I was trying to find my thing to make sure I was reading something. Um, okay, so the other questions I have are regarding page 10. Um, first, looking at the circuit breaker, um, I was wondering if the reason that we're projecting $500 million still coming is because they pay, or, sorry, $500,000 still coming or 521 um, is because they're paying in chunks and we haven't gotten our last chunk. Yes, yeah, circuit breaker is, um, I, I assume that you're referring to circuit breaker um, and the circuit breaker line is, is paid, the revenue is paid quarterly. So our last payment is made on June 30th. And so that's when it will be posted. Okay, and we expect that it will come in as billed, because I know sometimes they don't always pay out everything they had originally said they would, or it, it changes. Um, to answer that, I have not heard any information that would say otherwise. Um, so, okay. And also sometimes they do pay a little bit more if there's okay. money in the pot, but okay. no um, information. And then, and then my second question is also on page 10 and it's about the foreign exchange and i'm confused where it says projected the completion is 199,000 or yeah actually maybe it's just dollars yeah. i i don't know what that is mm -hmm. so so is so, this the zero is this effectively the zero that that mr cardin was talking about before <laughs> No, well, no, no, what I, I believe, and I appreciate first, I appreciate you sending me the questions in advance for this particular portion of this report. Um, the, the negative $199 is a, a methodology that we use for uh, the grants and revolving reports. And what it does is it basically assumes that the budget amount that's in the, in the system will be, um, will be spent down to zero. And so in this case, the actual is higher. And so it's reflecting a negative amount, which essentially, if you look at the line above, which is 85103, the instructional materials on page 10 for foreign exchange, is, re is projecting a 287. So really what's left to spend that we, what we believe is $88. And that's uh, not really reflected clearly here. So we'll go back and try to work on this to make it a little bit more clear for the next report. Right, I, I guess I was confused when I was looking at this, but I guess my real question is, so where where is the missing revenue in this? Well, um, and and also why how are we having expenses if we didn't have the students so the the foreign exchange uh fund supports the arlington public schools and more specifically some uh aspects of the high school and sometimes uh professional development district-wide and so there's been expenses on this fund throughout the year. Um, and that was based on the school committee approving a certain amount of money for us to spend on these funds. Okay. Um, and we have a, 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 a current balance that we're able to spend for. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I understand now. It's not actually talking, it, it's talking about what fund the monies that we've been spending are coming from, not the the title isn't actually where the fund, what the fund is spending the money on necessarily. So, Correct. okay, thank you. Ms. Morgan. Um, Mr. Mason, can you just remind me, so ESSER isn't, we can't go in arrears with ESSER, right? ESSER is just ahead. Like we can't go back and, and bill things to ESSER. No. From it, so that's only FY twenty two, and ahead. Okay. Correct. Right. So you and for but for some of the ARPA stuff, we may be able to go back and pull it out from FY nineteen, but we'll need to negotiate with the town about where that actually lands because we can find lots of lost potentially find some lost revenue that 
goes and sits on the town's books and not on ours. Which yeah, is so, not necessarily a bad thing. I mean. Yeah. So, it, so it, and just a further comment, if I can. The, the ARPA, we, you know, me uh, and the deputy town manager, Sandy Pooler, worked on some estimates on in which funds, based on the calculations provided through uh, the formula that's provided from, from ARPA. And there were some estimates that what we could possibly get back from at least the first year, which was between four, to, four million to $8 million between all the funds from the lost revenue. And this same calculation would happen again for this fiscal year, well, th this calendar year, it is by calendar year. So it will happen for this calendar year, 20 and 2022's calendar year and 2023 calendar year. Thank you. Looking around, seeing no other hands. Do I dare go forward? Let's try it. Dr. Bodie, superintendent's report, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hainer. Actually, the, uh, the first thing that's not on my list, I have a, a couple of things that uh, are not, um, has to do with an award one of our um, coalitions in the high school has received. I'm going to ask Ms. Keyes, who is the president of the Arlington Educator Association, to talk about this award. Thanks, Dr. Bodie. I just found out about this yesterday. So this is breaking news and it's really exciting. I'm gonna give you a little bit of background. Um, since 1983, the Mass Teachers Association's Human Relations Committee has reviewed nominations and selected recipients of annual human and civil rights awards. They honor those who have shown extraordinary dedication to civil rights and human relations, honoring those who dedicate themselves to equality for all, which is a proud tradition of the MTA. They have been given in the past to individuals and to groups. And one of the recipients this year of the Kathleen Roberts Creative Leadership Awards is the Arlington High School Asian American Coalition. Um, they are led by Sane Park, who is a world language teacher at the high school. Um, she nominated them for this award. Their nomination was supported by both district and high school level administration. And they are going to be receiving their award during a virtual ceremony on June 18th. So I'm very excited for this recognition to be coming to Arlington because I think our students have been doing a phenomenal job with celebrating and supporting differences among themselves and really educating their classmates. And I really encourage you to go look at this group's um, Instagram. It's A-H-S-A-A-C. They have a phenomenal series of posts that have been done by their student leader, Andrew Yang, um, about Asian American hate and some of the biases that we see in the media and in other aspects of culture that have really served our community well. And I hope that they're able to continue their work. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, it's really a great honor for the work. And I would echo Ms. what Ms. Keith said. Our students have been phenomenal. Um, uh, this group, as well as other groups, and bringing student voices in terms of having us become a much more um, caring, uh, aware, tolerant society. And um, I really applaud all their efforts. So it's terrific. And you certainly will be welcome to attend the, the June 19th uh, award ceremony. 18. We also have, uh, it was, you know, I talked about this before in the newsletter, but I think it's also worth mentioning since we're talking about uh, recognitions is that one of our fourth grade teachers at Thompson, Sarah Marie Jetty, is a semifinalist now for teacher of the year in Massachusetts. And so this is a tremendous honor as well. Um, and so I want, I'm hoping uh, for her because I think she is an extraordinary teacher and uh, but I, among many extraordinary teachers in our district, as we have seen many years, but particularly this year, our teachers have really uh, shown um, great flexibility, resiliency, creativity, determination, as they have um, as they encountered all the challenges of this year. 
And, you know, they're exhausted. We've heard that before. But I think that they also will leave this year. I hope they leave this year feeling very proud of what they have accomplished because they have accomplished so much. And we will always be very grateful for their efforts um, in, on behalf of our students. So it's a having a, a semi-finalist, I think, is also speaks to our entire entire staff, but we particularly uh, wish her well. She is the author, by the way, of a book, of a children's book for middle grades. And um, I've read it and uh, I, I, I've, We'll put it out there for everybody else if you're interested. It's really actually quite, it's sort of in the fanciful Reardon tradition and um, or um, Magic Tree House. That's a little bit younger version, but it's uh, it's really quite, it's really quite lovely. So uh, where the wind blows, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Um, all right, so we talked a little bit about the high school. Every day, it's in, it's a little changes, but we know some um, as we drive by and park every day. So it's it's definitely moving along. And one of the things that will be scheduled um, in June are some walkthroughs. And ACMI has agreed to be part of one of the walkthroughs. So everyone uh, in the community is going to be able to see what the what the school likes looks like from the inside. There will be, there's also certainly looking at the videos that um, our contractor Consigli uh, helps provide. It also gives you a good idea of what it's looking like right now. So uh, th that's to be coming. The, the subcommittee work continues. We have, um, I know I have two in the next couple of days. And then next, uh, next Tuesday, June, is that the fourth, I think? No. What is next Tuesday? That is the next building committee meeting. Uh, and uh, I thought, Julie, uh, Julie, you were going to say what the date was. It was a. It's the first. <laughs> it's the first. <laughs> um, OK, thank you. All right, moving on. Um, uh, I also want to um, mention this evening to the to our school committee, uh, that there's going to be a change coming at lab. Uh, Patrick Barbieri, who has been the executive director for the last 14 years, is going to retire as of the end of the school year. Um, his announcement you know, came late enough in the school year that the, the board of directors, which are the five superintendents from the five districts that created lab, and that's Lexington, Arlington, Belmont, Bedford, and Burlington, um, has appointed uh, Dr. Bill Lupini to be the interim director. Uh, Dr. Lupini um, uh, was former superintendent in Brookline and Essex Agricultural School, and then a superintendent in New Hampshire. And he is going to take this on as well as the search for next year. Um, but I do want to make a, a few comments about um, uh, Mr. Barbieri. He has been a really an extraordinary uh, director for lab. Uh, and he, he, well, he's been 14 years as an executive director. He has spent his entire career at lab as a, as a teacher and different administrator. And, and as I said, 14 years as an executive director. Um, I think, I think the term that has been used um, frequently by several people is how transformational he has been as a leader. Uh, there has certainly been a growth of programs, a number of them, which I think he's particularly proud of in terms of some of the vocational. But in particular, I think he is very proud of these respite houses that he has worked with TIL, another organization to create. They, they are in Lexington. And these homes provide an opportunity for parents who have uh, a disabled student to be able to take a weekend off and the students be, you know, live in this house and become part of um, basically living there and taking care of it and learning uh, a, uh, many skills. 
So he, his, he will be a great loss to lab. Uh, and I think he'll be, will be, will be certainly be looking to find someone who will continue his work and have, and, and, and hopefully in time, love lab as much as uh, Mr. Barbieri does and probably always will, will have for the organization. And, I, and one thing I can say too is from feedback from parents, uh, uh, we have lots of different programs and what makes lab unique is that the programs exist in these school systems buildings. And as you know, we're building um, lab classrooms in the new high school. Um, it's just how happy their children have been in the lab program. Uh, they've participated in the, Olymp the Olympics uh, program, which we haven't been able to have the last couple of years, but it's certainly been a highlight in past years. And I think another one they've had are, are proms or, or get togethers where kids can get dressed up. So there's just been so many things that make the lab experience so memorable to so many families. And I just want to acknowledge what great work he has done um, for the organization. I don't know if there's any, anybody else would make, like to make a comment about that. Um, go on to the last issue, which is EDCO. Uh, to, Mr. Carden. Sure, thank you. So yes, I'm, I, we are a lab, a lab family as well, and uh, just relatively recently, but Mr. Barbieri's um, you know, reputation you know, preceded him. Um, you know, he's well known uh, in the community for building a very strong and caring program um, the, the lab program attracts students from not just the five districts that are members. We're very fortunate to be a member because basically we get, you know, priority, we get the programs right in our schools, uh, but also from 60 other districts across Eastern Massachusetts. People come from all over for the programs that he's helped build. Um, he was very early on the podcast scene uh, and he has a podcast that he's recorded with helpful information for parents. Um, uh, he and himself, not, not only being having worked for lab for a very long time, but his sister uh, is a lab graduate. So he has a personal connection, which really makes a big difference. So uh, he, he will be missed and, uh, you know, we'll be looking forward to the process for finding a, a new leader. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And, and you're absolutely right. I think that one of the um, motivations for how important the Woodland Homes would be, that um, these respite homes was guided by that. I will say one more thing that I think that's outstanding in terms of lab is that he has been quite helpful in parents who want to buy a house that you know, their children can share. He's been, um, lab has given a lot of counseling on that issue. So, so moving on to EDCO, um, here's another great organization, which unfortunately is going to, it's in the process of dissolution as we've talked about. And we've also talked about earlier this meeting in terms of our representation on that. Um, we've had increased assessments this year um, for the operating costs of FY21. And we've been able um, to be assessed for some of the costs that can be attributed to this year, which will reduce what um, uh, our share of the dissolution costs will be, which still remain quite unknown as we deal with a number of issues. And, and that will certainly be the work of next year. So uh, we, we have, um, uh, districts have paid the, the assessment, the increased assessment, uh, which total for Arlington about 70,000 this year. And uh, um, EDCO will be able to make its um, uh, um, bu budget for this year, be able to close it. So another thing that we are working very um, uh, diligently about is making sure that the retirees from EDCO um, are still have some um, supplement, way to supplement uh, the cost for healthcare in the, in, in the years ahead. And so again, that will be an area of focus. And, and at this point, uh, that is still something that's being worked out, but will be discussed. Um, it's much more detailed in the, in the year ahead. 
So I just wanted to give you a, an update on that. But one other part of that are to let you know that uh, our interim director, um, Dr. Tamer, has done a fantastic job of being able to move some of the programs that, that everyone thought were so valuable, such as the deaf and hard of hearing program that was located in the Newton Public Schools. Another collaborative has taken that over. And uh, other programs uh, also have been moved, or or uh, we we certainly have um, executive uh, director directors of special ed and districts have been able, given the time necessary, to find other placements. Also, some very important programs that have been part of the EDCO um, offerings. Uh, one for professional development. One is the EMI program, which. Um, provides a very affordable way for educators to get their principal license. That also is going to be um, in existence. That was, a, that was something we were very concerned about. So that will continue. Um, and the ideas program, you've heard us talk about ideas here at the, at the table. This is a um, professional development uh, op opportunities programs uh, courses to uh, around anti-racism, anti um, bias, and um, responsive teaching. So that program is also going to continue to exist and it is going to be under the auspices of the Massachusetts Superintendents Association, which is um, probably an excellent place for them to be because that is uh, the issues of equity, inclusion, diversity, and um, anti-racism are a focus of that organization in the year ahead, not to mention years ahead. So that, um, unless there's any questions on EDCO, that's my report on EDCO at this time. Any questions from any members of the board, comments? Dr. Bodie, does that conclude your report? That concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Hayner. Thank you. Moving on to the consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in a normal sequence. Approval of warrant, warrant uh, number 21256 dated 5-18-2021. Total amount $708,314.56. Approval of minutes, school committee regular minutes, May 13th, 2021, and school committee special meeting, August 31st, 2020. Approval of Ida Robbins scholarship presented to two students with the highest GPA. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Is there a second? Second. Roll call, um, Ms. Exton? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Rampey? Yes. Mr. Carden? Yes. And I vote yes. Thank you. Subcommittee and liaison reports. Uh, budget, Dr. Rampey? Nothing to report. We'll be sending you a meeting in the next couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Community relations, Ms. Exton. Sure. So um, I have two uh, updates, one on our chat and one on uh, the return to in-person meetings. Um, we had the last chat, uh, sorry, the last chat of the school year will be this Saturday, May 29th at 11 a.m. Um, everyone is welcome, but especially families and caregivers of students in grades six through 12. Um, I also just wanted to mention at a kindergarten to fifth grade chat a few weeks ago, a, fam, a parent asked about the librarians um, and Dr. McNeil reported back that um, APS had hired another certified librarian um, who has already started working in the district. Um, so we are continuing to grow our library program. Um, so the subcommittee will meet next Thursday, June 3rd at 4 p.m. to discuss the return to in-person meetings um, and school committee chats. Um, I have spoken to Christine Bongiorno um, of the Health and Human Services Department 
and Dan Sheehan, the interim director of information technology regarding uh, the COVID piece of this and the logistics and details for returning to in-person um, in some kind of hybrid format. Um, and there's some technology needs um, that need to be put together in order for us to have hybrid meetings. So our subcommittee will discuss that further. Um, Mr. Sheehan will be, um, I believe, at the meeting next Thursday so we can get more specific information. Thank you. Curriculum instruction assessment and accountability, Mr. Cardin. Uh, thank you. So um, because I came in late, just to clarify, the um, draft goals often would go to CIAA for review, but um, given the, the timing of the year and, and uh, the discussion tonight, I think that's not necessary. Is that correct, Mr. Hainer? Uh, I would defer to you. I, I, I think the timing and the opportunity to ask questions for us uh, as a full board have already been met going Great. forward. So, <laughs> right, so there's no plan for a CIA meeting uh, for now, and so no report, thanks. Thank you. Uh, facilities, Mr. Thielman. No report. Policies and procedure, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, thank you. Uh, we will certainly need to pay attention to community relations in their discussion of uh, the uh, return to in-person meetings because I'm sure that where we are going will require some adjustments to our policies. So uh, 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 I, I, I appreciate uh, the chair uh, keeping me in the loop. The only other thing we have outstanding right now is developing a policy pertaining to the land use acknowledgement statement that was adopted by town meeting, uh, exactly how we're going to do that. Uh, so uh, that's on the agenda. We'll start thinking about this after we conclude the town meeting. Uh, I have a, a quick question. Uh, the two issues that uh, Dr. I mean, Ms. Elmer brought up earlier, uh, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think policies and procedures have already addressed this and it's just us bringing them in, in line in, in our documentation. Which issue is that? Uh, the uh, restraint. Oh, the restraint policy. Yeah, we adopted that. So okay. um, we're, okay. we're fine there. Great. Are there any other, any liaison reports at this time? Any members have any announcements they'd like to share? I have one, uh, I would like to recognize the workplace program at the high school, the staff and the students for the help today in uh, putting up 157 flags for the flags, for, uh, Arlington Rotary Flags for Heroes program. I would invite um, the uh, members and the public to go up and walk among the flags to see all the ones that people recognize. Uh, it's, it's an impressive sight. Uh, and we're looking forward, hopefully, to come back to the high school once the high school is done. Um, any future agenda items at this time? We have one more meeting scheduled for this year, folks. And I'm sure you can always email me between now and then. Okay, um, executive session. Next strat. Sorry. Just as a quick comment, uh, there's a video circulating from Channel 4, Cal Hodge, who is our goaltender for our lacrosse team scored a goal and that made channel four news so uh, if you can dig that up on on channel four that's well worth looking at thank you mr schlickman <laughs> i'm amazed okay. how you can multitask through all our meetings thank you ready for executive session statement to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or, con or contract negotiations with union and our non-union, which if held in open meeting may have a detrimental effect to conduct strategies with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in the open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted. Um, will, Mr. Spiegel, will we be returning uh, to open session? No. Thank you. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. No, uh, are we going okay. to executive session? I'm sorry, a motion to go into executive session. Almost had a perfect meeting. <laughs> Almost. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. second. Roll call vote. Ms. Exton. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. 
Mr. Thielman. Yes. Ms. Dr. Impey. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. And I vote yes. Thank you.